Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I am one of your two co-hosts for today. Um, I am John DeLynn, and I am so excited to have in studio with me my partner in truth and righteousness, Kara Burrell. Hey, Kara. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited for this one. Yeah, it's fun to be back in the saddle with you, Kara. And uh, I'm super excited to have back with us um, someone who's kind of been a little bit on hiatus only because he moved. But we are so thrilled to have back with us remote, but also with Brick, John Larson. Hey, John. Hey, John. Nice to be back. I'm broadcasting live from an undisclosed location. <laughs> Did okay. I match the bricks? I try to get the same bricks as your other studio. It's like you're here. I know, right? <laughs> it's Hi, awesome. everybody. I'm back. So, John, explain to everybody why you've been gone a little bit. Well, uh, as we talked about, I, I moved uh, to the beautiful state of Oregon. And um, we started moving into our house right at the end of December. And anybody who's ever moved, a, a big family knows that it's a lot of work and it took us this much time to get a uh, kind of a space and everything set up, but here we are, we're ready to go. So we're back in the saddle. That's so awesome. And, and uh, we're one episode behind. So I, I owe you guys an extra episode. Okay. No worries. Uh, we're just glad to have you up and I'm going to give a shout out to Gerardo because uh, Gerardo was the one who uh, ordered a bunch of equipment for you and sent that to you and then helped you set it up. And uh, yeah, we also want to thank just our donors and supporters because um, they're the ones who paid for all the equipment. So what's it like to have a, a studio set up in your new home, John? Um, it Well, it feels kind of like, you know, one of those, uh, what, what are all those uh, reality TV shows where everybody can go in and kind of record themselves. There's a little room downstairs. It also feels, I'm in the basement, so it feels a little bunkery, like I'm broadcasting from, you know, behind enemy lines. But well, that's you. I think See, that line. I'm, I'm out here. <laughs> I think that's. I think that's a line Radio Free Mormon uses. Is that right? Well, I've. I've. Uh, I yes. I suppose. I really. I. <laughs> I, I I'm. I'm afraid to admit that I, I. don't really listen to Mormon podcasting. Love the Mormon podcasters. You guys are all great. Your content is good. It's just not my jam. John, when, <laughs> um, when you're top dog, John, uh, you don't need to watch other or listen to other podcasts. I'm not constantly. really the top dog. I'm the, like the old dog sitting in the corner by the fire. Like I don't, I'm not interested in the dog pile anymore. <laughs> All right. Well, we're glad to have you. And is that brick real? I think that's a really important question, John Larson. Is that brick it's, real? It's as real as, as everything we talk about here on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. Well, uh, before we jump in, a couple of quick announcements. First of all, welcome to everyone who's joining us both on Facebook and YouTube. We want uh, we want your comments throughout. And John Larson, I don't know if you know this, but we have the ability to bring callers on and have them join us and ask questions. So John, if you're comfortable at the end, we may have some people join us to ask us questions. Yeah, bring them on. The more the merrier. Okay. So, so viewers and listeners, those of you who are kind of hardcore uh, super fans and want to have a chance to ask a question or two to John Larson or to Kara or to me or to just uh, provide some insight, uh, plan on us sharing the link to the StreamYard. Uh, you know, midway through the episode, we'll share it in the comments on Facebook and YouTube. And then uh, don't join if you're a jerk, only join if you're cool. And if we can include you in the show, we will. Um, also, please know that we've started a Discord server for Mormon stories that we're also kind of sharing with Bill Real and Radio Free Mormon. And so Discord's a great way for you to find community for text, text chatting and voice chatting and even playing games and video chatting. There's almost 800 members of that Discord channel now. It's a pretty beefy channel, and we think it's going to grow. So if you go to mormonstories.org, there's some social media buttons in the top left, and you can find the Discord server and add yourself to it. Um, wanted to make sure mention that. Kara, I think you had a few announcements you wanted yeah. to make. Why, why don't you jump in and make a few announcements? All right. And before I do that, I just wanted to read a couple comments. Scott said, Gerardo is the glue that holds Mormon stories together. The best. And then Cherish followed that up Amen. by saying, a call-in show with the Johns. How cool. And I'm not even self-conscious that there wasn't a compliment for me. What about the Kara? That what about is the not Kara? what I read those for. It just was just 
I just want to make sure that everyone knows that they're, they are cherished. So, um, and then the announcements that I had just center around, Hey, there's super chats on YouTube. Please join us. And a great way to donate to the podcast is by uh, hitting the little dollar sign at the bottom. And hopefully we can read your comment and um, throw us some cash to help support Mormon stories and OSF. Why do we, forward. why do we ask for that? Uh, Cause this is a donor funded podcast and it's just a really cool community feature just to like help us, you know, throw us a little, a little bit of cash um, is always fun. And then second of all, Mormon stories, listeners, I know you guys are cool, but there's some people out there who have been like commenting on my body and I just, okay, I'm going to be cool with you guys. You just came out of a very patriarchal religion and maybe you guys don't know yet that like you can't actually comment on people's bodies on women's bodies and on my body so if you have a comment about like my cleavage or anything may or what i'm wearing or what sometimes i'm wearing too much clothes which was another weird comment i've gotten that i'm not dressing appropriately for the podcast you could just turn it off you could listen to it on podcast if um this offends you so i just want to let people know that if they have an opinion about my body Really cool tip. You can actually write it down on a piece of paper, hold it up really teeny tiny and tightly, go see your proctologist, go have them take out whatever is inserted in your rectum, and then place that opinion squarely up there. So without further ado, let's do our John Larson episode. And the other only other announcement is that if you can't tell already, it's John Larson comes on, you're going to get a PG-13 episode. So if you are not into that, don't write us letters and say, hey, I didn't like that because Kara told you at the top of the show, we're doing John Larson just kind of brings a different energy than a normal Mormon story. So it's not always going to be as faith promoting and friendly, but we obviously welcome any people from any faith background to watch, watch listen, participate. So that's all I got. I love um, it. Um, yeah, uh, there's a thank you, Kara. And I, I want to echo that comments about uh appearance of any of the co-hosts but especially Kara are just not welcome unless they're compliments right Kara do you want our compliments okay I don't, need, you rather... I don't need any validation from anyone <laughs> okay yeah so no comments on Kara's appearance uh I'm sorry you even had to make that announcement but you did it with such class Kara yeah I'm a classy joke teller too John you look fabulous tonight is that a new hoodie uh it's an old hoodie but wait did you just comment on my appearance I'm telling you when you look <laughs> fabulous. I stole this off my dad's back, literally. I was like, I like that shirt. Can I have it? So we're, if you guys don't like the way we look, there's a podcast available for you. This is the YouTube version. No, and thank you for that. Thank you for the kind words, Kara. I appreciate it. Yeah. And John, doesn't John look great? Hey, thanks. Hey, yeah. And, and, and for those internet guys out there, I, I'm fat. So you can put it up there if you want. Um, yeah. That's my that's my comment on body shaming. I uh, I shamed myself first. Okay. We're okay. Ready to sorry, go. everyone. Sorry. We we. Uh, <laughs> you guys still there? <laughs> we jumped out for a second. So. <laughs> okay. Um. Thanks for thanks for covering for us, John. Um. All right. So, all right. We covered Discord. We covered Super Chat. There are a couple events that we want to make uh, everyone aware of. Um. We have a new events tab on the Mormon Stories Podcast Facebook page. Um, I think there's a women's event uh, that's coming up soon uh, with a new uh, project called the Open Arms Collective that um, that Jen Camp is running. So I think it's March 20th. Uh, you can go to mormonstories.org slash events and you can sign up for that event. It's 1 to 3 p.m. in American Fork, uh, again, March 20th. And it's uh, Jen, Jen has described it in a previous little announcement, but it's basically just an opportunity for women al along the Wasatch Front, women and non-binary people along the Wasatch Front to get together and have um, have a what what Jen likes to call a, um, a collective where women get to know each, women and non-binary people get to know each other, connect, um, make friends, and provide fellowship to each other. Also, uh, there's Thrive for Women, April 2nd. There's Thrive for Men, April 3rd. And then there's Thrive Houston, Thrive Southern California, and I think there's a Thrive Florida. And you can go to, again, mormonstories.org slash events and check out any of those activities. Um, all right. So I think those are all our announcements. Kara, anything else? No. The only last announcement is to ask, are you guys ready for this? Oh, my gosh. John uh, Larson no. in the house sort of 
virtually, but like, gosh, dang it. I'm so happy this is happening. Logical fallacies and Mormonism. Let's get into it. All right, John, we've got you back. So uh, where do you want to begin tonight? All right, let's get going. Okay, so we we evolved um, and our brains evolved at the same time we did. So we don't think abstracted from our bodies or from the world that, that we live in. I think that's a really important point. Um, because sometimes we're trying to understand um, how we think and how we process and faith as if we come from some uh, great mass of spirit and then we come down and inhabit these bodies. Uh, that's that's really not the case. And I know for those of you who are just coming out of the church, you've been you've been um, stuck in that paradigm. Actually, for most of us in Western culture, been stuck in that paradigm for so long that it kind of blows one's mind to think that there's no separation between the brain and the mind. But um, the reason I bring this up is that we evolved these structures. Uh, the, the, the structures we evolved to learn came around um, cultural cohesion, keeping the tribe together um, and passing on information verbally um, and observationally to the next generation. That's so as a, as a human being, are, you, are, we, are, we staying, are you catching up with me, John? Are we yep, are still everything's here? Everything's good, yeah. Okay. So, so, yeah, go ahead. No go. So as, as a human being, we have to stay in connection with our tribe and we have to try to understand the world around us so we can learn to do things like sew our clothes and hunt animals. We don't come with that right out of the womb like other animals do. So the problem is there are some gaps in our thinking and there are biases that, that, that we know about that we can see all over the world right now. I mean, a, a great one to see is to listen to Russian um, citizens who have been indoctrinated in the state media for so long and how they're interpreting the events in, in Eastern Europe right now. Um, you, you have two worldviews um, coming into, into conflict. And so you could say, well, John, either one of them could be correct. Well, that's possible in the abstract, but I would say kind of look at their fruits and see what they're doing. If there's one side that's constantly curtailing communication, cutting you off from the rest of the world, telling you not to talk to people, telling you not to read things, telling you not to listen to others, you're probably not on the right side of things. So we started to figure out tools to get through bias about 2,500 years ago. And we've been working on that tool set for the last, uh, you know, three, three millennia. And we've gotten pretty far on it um, in terms of understanding um, what are approaching truth, trying to figure out what is real and not what is just our tribal interpretation or what we think should be real or what we think should things should be. So, so um, fallacies are are basically um, a, 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 a the word the word is specious, um, which means that it's something that sounds appealing, it sounds correct, but it's not correct at all. It sounds like it's right. And, and for people who've not been trained in logic or trained in philosophy, a lot of this stuff just escapes them. Um, I, I wanted to choose some examples um, of, of fallacies out of Mormon writing. So I got here a copy of the Encyclopedia of Mormonism sitting in front of me, and I opened up to the article titled Apostate. And they're all here. I There's, there's literally... Um, 20, 30, 40 logical fallacies in this one article. Um, so it's important for us to like, like get down to the, to the ground of those. Okay. So that's, that's like my intro as we're going to start jumping into some form, some informal fallacies and explaining how they work in the church. You guys with me? Yep, we're with you. Yeah. Okay. So you hear the word informal fallacy and that's going to throw people for a, a loop. It's juxtaposed to, to a formal fallacy and formal fallacies are structural. They're mathematical. So so um, we're not even going to get into that in, in anything that, that we're doing here. you got to go take a class in it. You can go learn prepositional calculus and some other things to really formalize argument structure and see if, if things are true or not. So informal is doesn't mean like they're, hey, uh, we're just going to use, we're just drinking beers and swearing at each other. It just means we're not in the realm of formal or structured um, um, philosophy here. Um, what, but we do borrow one concept or, or two concepts that are going to come up from um, formal fallacies. And the first one is a non sequitur. And it's important that we understand what a non sequitur is. Non sequitur is whenever the the arguments that you're making do not actually support the conclusion that, you, that you're drawing. 
So if I say I had a blue balloon when I was a child and then and therefore I became a doctor, that's a non sequitur because there's no obvious or logical connection between owning a blue balloon and becoming a doctor. You would have to have a lot more arguments in there to actually make a case that the blue balloon caused me to be a doctor. So that's what we would call formally a non sequitur. And they, they work in informal um, informal logic, too. So again, specious is 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 the is the word we want here, which means that it has kind of a ring of truth, or it seems plausible, but but it's not. Um, informal fallacies are a error in reasoning. This is why I was going on about evolution. There, there are our minds are are not completely perfect, and they have some weak spots in them. They have some things that we're very susceptible to. And it, it, you can get an introduction to them by watching music, magicians, right? They they exploit all those visual and psychological um, weaknesses that we have to make the trick seem real. So so um, these things are 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 there, and they're going to grab all of us if we're not careful. Okay, but I do want to give a big warning, and this is a very important one for the ex Mormons. If an argument is a fallacy, if it's an informal fallacy. That does not mean that the conclusion is not true. It just means that the argument is invalid. So I can make um, an invalid argument to arrive at a conclusion. But the reason I say this is I've, I've heard lots of people debate online, and then they, they'll, they'll point out an informal fallacy that, say, an, an apologist makes, and they'll say, therefore, you're wrong. The apologist is not wrong for making an, an informal fallacy, but just that the argument they were making doesn't drive to the conclusion. It's it's a it's a it's a little nitpicky point, but it's it's really important. And I want to make sure that makes sense to you guys. Yeah, it's like a, a do better, the fallacy of a fallacy. Just saying do better, but not necessarily that like your conclusion is completely wrong. Right. If you if you show somebody has committed an informal fallacy, it doesn't mean their conclusion is wrong. It just means the argument is wrong. Okay. So when you have no arguments behind whatever conclusion you're driving to, we call that a naked assertion. Um, and a naked assertion is just you're saying something that you have no backing for. Like, I um, mainline the ghost of George Carlin, and he talks to me in my head. All right, that's a that's a conclusion. That's a it's an argument that I'm making. But it's a it's it's a naked assertion. There's no I'm not offering any proof. I'm not off offering any any reason for you to believe it. You just have to decide if you're going to believe it. So if we do undercut all the all the arguments as being informal fallacies or or being fallacies, then we can leave it as a naked assertion, and that leads us to Occam's razor. So Occam's razor is simply the idea that if you have two theories explaining the same phenomena, pick whichever one is simplest. Now let's let's suppose that you don't do that. Let's suppose you throw Occam's razor out because a lot of um, a religious apologists will throw it out temporarily for a short time while they're making arguments that so they'll bring it back later. Um, it's just at that point, um, you know, you you could say uh, let, let let's say you didn't believe in Occam's razor, and and then uh, Kara and I were were in a room with the door closed. There's a gun. It's smoking. I'm standing. She's dead on the floor. So a detective would come in and say, okay, nobody can come in or out. There's John. There's a smoking gun. Kara's dead on the floor. If you don't believe in Occam's razor, you could say, well, there might have been 10,000 ghosts of Roman soldiers in there. And actually might be 44 guns that John used a, 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 a ray gun to push to another part of the universe. Or it might be that the walls actually aren't walls and there's a trans-dimensional. You see the problem is that once you say there's no limitation to whatever arguments you can make, there's no limitation on anything at all. You can just say whatever you want. And all, all of those theories would be equally valid because they would all explain the outcome. Does that make sense? Totally, yeah. Okay. So the conclusion to an argument must follow from the, 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 the arguments. Um, and oftentimes church materials are very carefully constructed to not have you do any of this stuff at all. So normally when you're in Sunday school, you're not even making any kind of logical arguments at all. You're just saying, you're just making these naked assertions, just one after the other after the other. Okay, uh, let's talk a little bit about burden of proof. 
the burden of proof is on whoever is making the argument. So um, I actually don't, and this is what makes my position a little bit easier as a critic of the church. I actually don't ever have to prove anything. And actually, I never try to prove anything. My rhetorical stand is just to show you that the arguments that the church uses to um, prop itself up are wrong. And the church is not what it says it is. But I never make an argument about what is outside of that. That's left to the individual. We've talked about that ex-Mormon's hero attorney. That's part of the problem. You can use these sort of tools to deconstruct bad arguments. But knowing formal fallacy or informal fallacies will not help you actually construct an argument. They'll just tell you what you can't do. So, so the burden of proof is always on the church because they're the ones making the crazy claims. I'm not making any crazy claims whatsoever. Um, you know, so if I say I'm an atheist, I say that I'm an atheist because I've never seen an argument made for the existence of God that makes any sense in my mind. That's different than saying I don't believe in God, but I don't believe in God because no one's ever done it. You know, I just I don't believe there's a tea cup circling the moon. Um, I don't I don't have any space for that that in my mind. Okay, so I think we've we've set it all up now. We're ready to go in and start talking about them. And Are tell me, ready? yeah, yeah, and tell me if I'm right, John. So like, it, if you if you were to stray from saying I don't believe in a god because I'm not convinced, to then saying I'm certain that there's no god anywhere in existence, you've now strayed into almost religious territory in, in the sense that you're making an extraordinary claim that you would need evidence to back up. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, I mean, let's unpack your 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 sentence. You, you, you use the word God, which is an argument in of itself. You're, you're implying that there's an entity that has properties, God, and you use the word existence. Again, you have to define what existence means. So, you know, like at some point here in the future, I'm going to die, but my body is still going to be right there. Do I still exist? Well, that's a, it's a tough question, right? And you, you, you said universe. So, so, so the, the, the problem is once you start making assertions like that, you fall into the same problem religions have. You have to define what God is, then you have to prove that that definition is actually real. Got it. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start with the big, I'm going to start with the, some of the big ones that get bantied around a lot. And part of that is for us to all under, understand what these things actually mean and what they don't mean. So the first informal fallacy we're going to talk about is the classic ad hominem. Now, I, I'll, I'll beg your indulgence as I use the Latin terms. And I do that because this stuff is fascinating to me. And all of these um, have a long history of when um, humankind first discovered them and what they mean and what, what they've been doing. So I'm a traditionalist and I like to use the, the old fashioned terms for them. Um, so this is a fallacy ad hominem or, or to the person. Um, and it, it basically uh, says that if you attack the the individual making the argument, that is a fallacy because the individual's character or the individual's other aspects actually don't have any bearing on whether the argument is true or not. So you could say, hey, you know, um, John said that, that the moon is made of green cheese, but John is a white man, so we're not going to believe him. Well, that's that's a fallacy. Because those yeah. two things are not connected at all. Like saying John DeLynn just knocked over the freaking camera in the studio, and therefore every argument he has is irrelevant. Right. That's just right. an example. Maybe it happened. Maybe just now. Maybe it didn't. So, so, so ad hominem attacks are first of all they're the bread and butter of the church, and we're gonna we're gonna read through some. Um, but what it does is it is it mentally i was i was saying these things kind of evolved it gives us a filter for deciding who to listen to and who not to listen to so uh the classic ad hominem which you address at the beginning of ep every episode is you say john might use some english words that you listener don't want to hear so you don't have to listen that's that's a complete fallacy right there is no connection between swear words and the 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 strength of the argument, none whatsoever. Got it. Okay, but I think there's an important thing here before we and and ad hominems. There's a whole bunch of them. There's a whole bunch of different attacks. We're going to focus in on one, but there is actually a carve out where an ad hominem attack 
is a valid argument. And that carve out is if the trait in consideration is instrumental in part of the argument. So if you are saying you are a general authority and you've had these sort of experiences or that you are not this type, or you don't do this thing, or you did this thing. And that fits into your definition of what a general authority is. And then you say, you have to listen to me because I'm a general authority. That is a perfectly valid ad hominem attack. So because, because they themselves are constructing their character into the argument. Does that make sense? Yes. Absolutely. Your audio makes, makes been perfect sense. in our headphones makes, and I heard every word sense. you said. Makes total sense. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for the validation, guys. I like I like when you have to give me audio cues. That's that's, that's <laughs> okay. So I that that because that's something that, that this sort of debate goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth in the in the forums that you'll see where where believers and non believers um, 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 go after one another. And I, I want to make sure, because I've seen um, apologists push back on when when um, ex-Mormons say attack the character of general authorities or attack the the, the church for, for having not done something. It's likely that the ex-Mormon is actually making an invalid argument, but it's not necessary that the, the ex-Mormons make an invalid argument because that might be key to how the church has defined itself. Yeah, right. and I can see that really clearly in the way that Mormons and ex-Mormons talked about one another. Like, you wear funny clothes or you wear funny underwear. Like, it's not the funny underwear and it's of itself that would make the church, you know, untrue. It's what that underwear might symbolize and, like, the control that it has over a person. There's, like, more to the argument than be said. And it's kind of a waste of our breath to sometimes talk about, yeah, different things that could be under the ad hominem sphere, you know. Like, people talk about my nose a lot. That's how I know that you don't have an argument, you know. Yeah, so it, here's the second sentence. Again, I'm, this is the Encyclopedia of Mormonism published by the church, which they have tried to uh, hide, so they don't, they don't publish it anymore. Um, so this is the article on apostate. Members of the church vary in their level of participation or belief. Latter-day Saints who have serious, seriously um, contravened or ignored cardinal church teachings publicly or private are considered apostates so there's a lot of stuff going on in there but what i want you to see is is them casting shade i'm going to skip down a little bit apostates sometimes become enemies of the church leave the church which claims to be god's official church or leaving the church which claims to be god's official church containing the fullness of the gospel often results in feelings of guilt so, so you know, right there, and, and they're using weasel words because these guys are all PhDs, so they know what they're doing, the people who wrote this book. So, so they're putting a whole bunch of weasel words. And when I say a weasel word, what I mean is apostates sometimes become enemies of the church, where apostasy is defined elsewhere as just clearly leaving the church. So if they keep putting sometimes and some people and some who do, but you'll notice that the argument then stands, even though they say some people are like this. Well, is that one out of a thousand? Is that one out of ten thousand? Is that one out of a hundred thousand? Is that six out of you know six out of six? They're not going to define that because they're not actually making a, a really solid argument. But they will go through and they will they will cat they'll say, okay, ex Mormons feel guilty, ex Mormons are angry, ex Mormons are ugly, ex Mormons show off their shoulders, ex Mormons are fat. Whatever they want to do, they'll just keep doing that, especially if they can find that 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 somehow ticks into your pre-existing prejudices. So we can find lots of references, especially in the 19th century, where they talk about ex-Mormons becoming dark, dark skin, dark of eyes, dark of thought. And we can also find instances where they talk about um, uh, um, brown people becoming lighter as they engage in the church. Well, that's because they have an underground bias towards white skin. White skin in Mormonism is a sign of being godly, and brown skin is a sign of a curse of God, either from Cain or from the Book of Mormon or whatever curses came out there. So, so if they can tap into that with language, then they're going to bring you along with this ad hominem attack, and their whole point is having you not listen to them at all. Okay, so we're going to talk about a specific type of, uh, of fallacy, an ad hominem attack, which is the two... Quo Q. 
uh, to quo Q, which is um, basically it's trying to discredit your opponent by attacking the opponent's own personal uh, behavior and actions as being inconsistent with their arguments, therefore being hypocrisy. Hypocrisy in and of itself is not a fallacy. I can teach you the truth and do the opposite. That doesn't invalidate my argument of what I say. Um, it would invalidate my argument if I said, hey, um, to be a leader of the church, you have to be morally pure, and then you can show that I'm not morally, morally pure, whatever that means. Then you would invalidate it. But if you just say, hey, you know, they're bad people, we don't need to listen to them. John Larson swears he is uh, caustic, he is direct, blah, blah, blah. You don't have to listen to them. That is all a fallacy. You don't have to listen to me, but it, it, it doesn't deal with my arguments. And most of the attacks that I get from, from um, apologists or others have very little to do with anything I'm actually saying because I don't think they want to deal with that. Right. So so um, they actually use this and they twist it around this fallacy. Um, and they use the words acting as a man. So So what they say is, okay, well, we are men first. And men do bad things. So prophets are only a prophet when they are acting as a prophet, not acting as a man. As a matter of fact, they, they have that one right here um, in, in this. And they, they say, basically, apostates fail to understand that prophets sometimes are acting as men without actually defining what that is. So, so, so here is a, a carve out that they, they, they give by, by allowing themselves to be in the same in the two categories simultaneously. It's kind of a reverse on, on, the, on the whole thing. All right, let's go to our next fallacy. Any questions on ad hominem attacks? No, I live them every day. Yes, um, unfortunately, when you do stuff like this, you suffer them endlessly. Uh, the next one is, is a straw man attack. Um, a straw man is actually a, another form, well, not necessarily. Uh, what, what This is also called um, cherry picking or evidence suppression. So what a straw man is, is you want to attack a certain type of person. And so you construct that person. You construct the straw man, and then you burn down the straw man. Um, uh, Fox News does this incessantly. So um, what they do is they'll talk about liberals do this and liberals do that. Um, and But there's who? What liberals? What, who, who are we talking about? So they'll take this 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 generalization and say, hey, um, this is what's happening. They was right there in that first sentence. Apostates sometimes become enemies of the church. OK, well, if you're not describing how often they do so, then you've now constructed a straw man, which is apostates who are enemies of the church. Who are those people? Well, they're not going to say where do those people exist? They're not going to say but they're going to talk about them all the time. They're going to shape whole narratives around these people that don't exist. It's kind of like the, the leadership of Antifa. Who are they? Where are they? Where's their, where's their mailing address? Who are, where, where are these people in prison, right? It's, it's a straw man that's been constructed and you can usually spot straw men because you can't actually come up with an example of, of, of who they are because they want to debate a certain type of enemy. Both Mormons and ex-Mormons do this incessantly. Um, Ex-Mormons will, will portray Mormons as a certain type of person, and that may or may not be true. You know, they'll, they'll describe them as teetotalers who never drink in a cup of coffee, and they can't be with anybody else, and blah, 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 blah. But we all know plenty of Mormons who, who are everywhere on the spectrum of what they do and what they don't do. So, so if you take and then you create this Mormon in your head and then you sit and argue against them, you're not mm -hmm. actually making any real progress in terms of um, getting to the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, John, I, I, as I think about uh, straw men, let me tell you how I think about it. I think about sometimes what we do when we're, instead of... Um, fairly and accurately and charitably uh, representing our opponent's point of view, we will erect or, or put forward a point of view that our opponents probably don't have. And 
um, assert it as if as if that's uh, an important um, point for our opponent, and then we we knock it down. So an example might be, um, you know, if Jim Bennett comes on Mormon Stories and says, "All you ex Mormons, you think Joseph can do nothing right. You think that he's pure evil, um, and he did a lot of good. Therefore." ex-Mormons, you know, you guys are lame because you're unfair to Joseph Smith. When in reality, there are probably plenty of ex-Mormons that would acknowledge that Joseph Smith could do good and bad. Um, that To me, that's an example of a straw man because it's basically putting forward the argument of an opponent that they're not putting forward themselves that's easy to knock down. And then you knock it down as if you've actually accomplished something when in reality, you've really done nothing other than Created, created the perception that your opponent was wrong when really you were advancing an argument that they didn't have to begin with. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. And and oftentimes these these uh, fallacies can be overlaid on top of each other. So if we say something like um, uh, uh, ex-Mormons leave the church because they want to sin. Sometimes. Yeah, I mean, the question, if, if, if somebody really gave you that argument, you'd say, oh, you, you don't want to sin? You, you don't? you don't desire sin. Isn't that the very definition of sin or things we desire that we shouldn't have? Well, well, we, we sin too, but, but ex Mormons really wanted to sin. And, and, you know, like they, I had a brother-in-law and he left the church and then he had an affair and Mormons don't have affairs. Well, yeah, but he wouldn't have the affair if he hadn't left the church. These are all straw man arguments. We're talking, we're talking about hypotheticals of, of undefined words. What sin, what sin do people want to com commit? Um, right. And then how, how do you know? How do you know they wanted to sin? Where, where are you getting that information? Um, but yeah. but if you listen to a lot of um, talks um, coming from a church, they will construct tons and tons and tons of straw men. They just set them up and knock them back down again. But again, this is a bipartisan issue. Everybody's yeah. out there doing it, which is why the Internet is lame. Um, <laughs> you can randomly pick any thread on, on uh, Reddit. And then uh, this is John's Reddit roulette. Pick any random ex-Mormon Reddit thread and then go in there and type, this is a straw man argument. And, and I get 80% right. chance you'll be right. <laughs> yeah, and the only thing I want to add to that is, in my experience, um, you know, becoming an ex-Mormon sometimes is just con being confronted with information that you didn't know before, right? And so a lot of the conversations I've had online as an ex-Mormon just comes down to Mormons not knowing things that maybe they would be an ex-Mormon if they did know. So I've mentioned online one time on Twitter that one of the main reasons I left was beginning to understand that the church leadership doesn't accept evolution and that the prophet denies evolution. And, you know, you've heard those different quotes that Russell Nelson said, and a bunch of Mormons would argue with me. And they called that a straw man argument because they said Mormons accept evolution because it's taught at BYU. And I was like, that's not what I said. I'm like, the there's no straw man here if I can't support a leadership and so I'll get accused of straw man from people who don't know the church themselves. They'll think that I'm straw manning them. And I want to give a good faith interpretation. I admit, you know, where the church makes corrections, but you also are talking to people who don't have a good grasp of what the church actually is sometimes. And they will accuse anyone who says anything that's new to them as a straw man. So I just want to point that out. Yeah. Yeah. It, you're, you're right. But you're actually um, dipping your foot into our next fallacy, which oh. is the no true Scotsman. Um, the no true Scotsman. I don't know what the original story is, but but the 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 joke of the title comes from the idea that 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 um, that you just outlined. Say, um, well, um, say, um, let me let me let me try to think of a, an actual no true Scotsman. Um, say, I, can, I can think of one. I can think of one. Oh, Do you have one? Well, I th I think I could think of one. So. One of the one of the arguments, uh, you tell me if you think this qualifies, John. So, no true Scotsman is basically putting up this position that if you're not if you're not sort of the ideal perfect representative of a particular group, if in any way you have flaws or mistakes, then you're not a valid person to speak for the group. Now, that's that's my way of phrasing the no true Scotsman fallacy. You can tell me if I've got that wrong, but for me, the example would be. If an ex-Mormon leaves the church, you might say, well, they never really believed to begin with. They were That's never a, really, they were never really that committed. 
to begin with. A generalization of certain group by excluding any counter examples of not being pure enough to be included in your example. So let's go back to Kara's example. So, so they say, okay, Mormons, you say Mormons don't believe in evolution, which of course that argument is a fallacy because you've just grouped all Mormons and Mormons can believe whatever they want. Sure. Say the official position of the church is that there is no evolution. That's true. Now, now in, in your argument, somebody said, oh no, they teach evolution at BYU. No true Scotsman. Oh, the true Mormons know evolution. So, so, so it, what it takes is whenever you're making assertion about a population, then it limits that population down to say, well, well, so, so, so it's, it's like if I said, um, all Scotchmen, all Scotsmen drink scotch. And then you say, well, there's Bruce over there and he's drinking Irish whiskey. But like, well, no true Scotsman would drink Irish whiskey. That's, that's the, the oh he's not a so true sad. Scotsman anymore. Yeah. So, so that's the, that's the, the genesis of the statement. They're saying, well, no true Mormon, you know, like Mormons don't drink coffee. Well, my brother-in-law, Joe drinks coffee. Well, no true Mormon drinks coffee. So, so it, it it reduces the set, like you're saying, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. The only difference is I think that in a church that has such like dogmatic authoritarian leadership, you can say thing about, say things about Mormons generally, um, about, you know, they, there, some can drink coffee, some cannot. And so you have to be very precise in your language. And so, you know, that does the church support same-sex marriage? No. Do Mormons support same-sex marriage? Yes, some do. You know, do like Mormons support evolution? Yes, technically. Does the Mormon like prophet, seer, and revelators support evolution? No. So you have to be really precise with your language is my... Correct. Uh, and that's really the answer to get out of all these, be precise with your language. Sure. But I mean, here, here's a fantastic example of that. Say, okay... What, well, who is a Mormon? Well, Mormon is somebody who believes that the Book of Mormon is the word of God as translated by Joseph Smith in this latter days. Okay, great. Well, the polygamists down in uh, Colorado City, I'll believe that. Well, they're not true Mormons. Right. Um, um, so so you, you, you have a definition that you have, you have pushed out. And then when you show the counterexample saying, well, then... Then, then Mormons do practice polygamy because you just define Mormons. Well, this is this is, by the way, the reason the church got rid of the or tried to get rid of the definition because it's too broad. So, so they were always saying, well, all these other sects that don't class that 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 don't um, bow down to Salt Lake City, they keep calling themselves Mormons, but they're no true Mormons. Um, even though they don't necessarily provide, well, they'll, they'll narrow it down to say, well, what does it mean to be a Mormon? Well, Mormon means that you've done everything that the corporation has told you to do. Right. So, so they'll define out any sort of theological meaning only when they're having that argument. But if you go to Sunday school and you listen to general conference, they will define Mormonism out in terms of belief um, um, in, in this greater, this greater thing. So that's, that's the no true Scotsman. What, the, what you're doing all the time is you're shifting um, what 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 can be defined? You say, oh, that's that's not a good example, you know. Yeah, so you can kind of never be pinned down and never be proven wrong because your parameters are constantly like kind of within your head, unless you be more precise with your language. Yeah, right. So those three, the straw man, the ad hominem, and the no true Scotsman, I wanted to lead off with those because those are the ones you're going to run into the most. Um, just they're out there everywhere. Okay, the next one we're going to talk about is the argumentum ad populum. Um, what what this is, um, this is simply asserting that something is true because most people believe it, um, which is a, a fallacy, if you, if you think about it for a few seconds. The fact that most people in, um, I don't know, in Babylon believed in the, the, uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, that doesn't mean that the Epic of Gilgamesh was true or false. The fact that the majority of people believe that doesn't mean anything. Yeah. So, so when we start talking about the partition between ex-Mormons and, and Mormons, this works both ways. Um, a lot of Mormons will will assume that that the way that they believe and the way they see the world, because they're surrounded by Mormons, is the actual way the world is. And ex-Mormons getting surrounded by ex-Mormons oftentimes just invert that. They believe that Mormons are, are, are all wrong. Well, the wrongness of those people has no bearing whatsoever on how many people believe it. The church uses this fallacy. Remember, the fallacies all are kind of mapping to places in our head that don't work quite right. They love to use this one when they vote. 
so like um, every time at conference, you'll, you'll get there and you'll say, all who believe that these guys are all prophets here is let it right your right hand. And they'll all raise their right hand. You're like, oh, my God, look at all these people. Can all these That's people true. be wrong? <laughs> the answer is yes. We can. And, and we've all been wrong collectively, meaning all of humanity, many, many times in our history. And the fact that there is a lot of people who believe something or feel something or understand something does not make it true. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't push it along at all. John, what if people say, but look at all of the fruits of Mormonism. Look how good, there's so many good Mormons. Possibly be wrong and they're doing so much good for the world. Hey, Kara, we we uh, we dropped out. Could you just repeat that comment one time? I'm oh, sorry. we dropped out. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, John. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, I, you were talking about the fruits. They're yeah, fruits. Yeah, where do you where do you place that fallacy? The like, but the fruits of Mormonism are so good, and there's so many people. How could they all possibly be wrong? And everything they're doing is just making the world a better place. That's the well, argument my parents have that, to me every day. That can all be true, but it doesn't make Mormonism true. You know, like um. Like, there's good people doing good things everywhere, right? Uh, it has a the, book with it, though. That's a book. The, there, there have been examples of of um, amazing compassion on the side of the Russian invading forces, and there's been examples of amazing compassion towards the, the Russian invaders on the Ukrainian force. The fact that there have been good people doing good things on both sides of that conflict says nothing about the validity of the conflict from either side. It is just it is just an, an, an artifact. And the fact that you have a society that does really great things does not mean that the society is true. Those two things don't follow from each other at all. They're right. two separate realms, right? All right. All right. What's next? All right. Forward ho. I mean... So, yeah. so, John, I'll I'll just jump in really quick. Um, it seems like uh, when I was growing up in the church, uh, what the way that this argument uh, manifested to me was the the church would give that prophecy about Daniel and the stone cutting out of the mountain without hands, and the church would talk about its kind of exponential growth, and they would release those videos of like temples dotting the globe. And I, I feel like the assumption was if the church is growing, if the missionary program is growing, if, uh, you know, if, if people are swarming to the true church, then somehow that, that implies that it's true. Well, uh, the Pentecostalism was born fall, um, when, uh, what's his name, predicted the San Francisco uh, earthquake of what, 1918, 19 nine, whenever that was. And it has grown by some estimates to be a billion people who, who accept it, depending on who you ask, maybe half a billion. I don't know. Um, and, and most evangelicals kind of fall under the general umbrella of um, Pentecostalism. And we're, we're being, we're being, we're paying loose here. But the, the, the point is that whatever argument you make on the success of Mormonism, you can run into counter examples. Like, let's say, Reverend Sun Young Moon, um, his group, the Moonies, they have millions of people. Scientologists have millions of people. Jehovah Witnesses have millions of people. So it's only an argument for the validity of the church if you can at the same time make the argument that it that it's not an argument for the validity of all those other movements. There's a billion Hindus. You know, there's a billion Buddhists. Why, why, why is the growth of Mormonism from, from one million people to two million people impressive when you know other religious movements are growing by tens of millions and 20 millions so so it it, it it's it's specious in in that it doesn't it they don't connect to one another even at all like there's no there is no something in the universe that says if you get a lot of people to believe you that means something and that's exactly what what the argument says yeah it's, if yes, all the so, apostates become drug addicts, that that it's the same fallacy. That doesn't mean apostasy leads to drug addiction. You would have to um, scientifically prove that, and that's really difficult. You might show a correlation, but 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 causation, oh, that's tough. 
Yeah. Yeah. So, so as far as, um, as far as this argument goes, the whole world could become Mormon and that wouldn't mean that, that an angel delivered golden plates to Joseph Smith. Of course not. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. We all believe all sorts of dumb things all the time. And ex Mormons could all become, uh, you know, really bad, horrible, unhealthy people and die early. And that wouldn't prove the church was true either. Mm -mm. No, not at all. Yeah. 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 Um, there, there's, there's been a history of things that we've discovered and then forgotten about for hundreds of years sometimes. And the fact that you know, humankind didn't pay any attention to it all. Um, there is a great example, and I'm, I'm going to butcher it because I can't remember. I think it's Lamarckian um, evolution. Maybe somebody in the there were there were two um, pre prevalent um, um, evolutionary theories in the 19th century. One was sort of um, um, championed by you know Huxley and Darwin, which said these are random random mutations, and it's kind of a I'm way over simply, but survival of the fittest. So the mutations come in, and then whoever's best adapted to the environment survives. There's another theory of evolution that, that came about at the same time, which was that 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 evolution is guides itself. So in the second theory, they'd say giraffes have long necks because they wanted to get to the leaves that are up there. <laughs> You'll hear a lot of people say this. That is not how evolution works at all. The, the giraffe never looks up at the leaves and says, you know what? If my neck were, were, were 18 inches longer, I could get to those leaves. Um, but but um, unfortunately, the 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 Russian government sort of bought off on that second theory and threw their science behind for for part of the early 20th century. You can read about this out there. It's been written about quite a bit. You can't just decide a theory is correct and make it popular or legislate it or, or do anything and make it true. Truth is as truth is. And and the popularity of the idea, by the way, this is the fundamental Achilles heel of democracy. And, and I am not suggesting we do away with democracy, but democracy has huge problems in it. And one of them is you choose ideas by by how popular they are, which is why in the 20 in this 21st century, we are struggling so much, even though we have such scientific um, progress and we know so many things more clearly than we did 20 years ago or 50 years ago. The, we still govern based on popularity of ideas, and those two things aren't the same, and and they get it, they 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 cause big problems for us. Sure, yeah. Got it. Got it. All right, are, are we're now we're ready to talk about my favorite one, but you got to buckle up for this one a little bit because it's going to blow your noggins a little bit. You buckle up, Kara. All right, this is this is the fallacy of reification. Ooh. Uh, um, R e i f i c a t i o n, so you can look it up yourself. Reification is the problem of when you take an abstraction and then you assume that's true and then you make conclusions from the assumptive um, conclusion. I'll, let me walk you through an example. Have you ever watched these ghost hunter shows on, on television? Yeah, I was hooked on those in like eighth grade. I, I was, realized. I was this fallacy you're about to talk about. <laughs> I was traveling for business a, a couple weeks ago, and I, I, I usually don't watch TV. Like, um, but whenever I'm in a hotel, I just watch TV. I just watch the commercials because I don't see them. Um, so I was watching these these ghost hunter shows, and you know they have all these things. They they keep showing these photos of orbs, right? Little little pieces of light. To me, it looks like dust floating around the room. But but they'll say, okay, there's the ghost, or they'll talk about cold spots. Or they have all this electronic gear that 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 will make will make noise. The problem is we've never established that ghosts actually exist. So any conclusion you make about ghosts is fallacious. None of that equipment is real because you'd first have to establish that ghosts exist. This goes back to our God problem that we talked about. It suffers from a huge fallacy problem. Nobody has actually defined what the word God means. So any properties that you talk about God having are all fallacious. They're all reifications. They don't have any grounding whatsoever. You can only talk about the properties of something that has been already established as being true. This undercuts about 80% of everything the church does all the time because they will say, 
um, you know, faith is the better part of charity or something. Well, they haven't established that either faith or charity actually exist. Those are those are concepts, and they're they're not they're not clearly defined. They're not we don't know that they, they're real. So you can't talk about any properties of them. We haven't established that prophets are real. We haven't established that the afterlife is real. We haven't established yeah. that the life before birth is real. So all these building blocks of Mormonism are themselves not established. So you cannot drive any conclusions from any of those things. Yeah, it reminds me of if you ever get a pamphlet from a missionary or something. You know those typical like little the the pamphlets that you'll get and it'll say like just like in times of old god called prophets like abraham moses did you know today he also calls prophets and i'm like whoa 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 slow it down sisters and elders <laughs> like i have no idea if god called prophets of old so i'm not going to conclude that he i'm not going to take you on your word that he calls them of now like you've already kind of lost me and they don't realize that like most of the world still needs to be convinced that like moses and abraham were prophets to begin with or that establishing that Christ had a church at any point and that he needed to reinstate one, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great example. Mormonism depends on the idea that God speaks to us via our thoughts or emotions sure. inside our head as a non-external voice. That's that's a fundamental principle of Mormonism. Otherwise, the, the power structure of Mormonism collapses. No one has ever demonstrated that one's thoughts or feelings are the will of God, and no one has ever established that there is a God. We've hoped for it. Yeah, well, and we've kind but, of already established that hope doesn't matter for anything, does it? No. I mean, sounds Not in nice. terms of argumentation. No, not in terms of argumentation. Maybe just in terms of like, I, I, could, I could see somebody making the argument that like, because of evolution, because of our need, like you talked about at the beginning of being in a tribe, needing to push forward ideas that like, <laughs> while the actual thing might not matter, that's like a very nuanced Mormon, you know, point of view that like the actual legitimacy of the prophet doesn't matter because it's being part of the tribe that push us for, pushes us forward as a species. And that's what I'm like, that's what I'm really into. And the actual like necessity of prophets to tell me one thing to do with my life, I'm going to pick and choose that part. You know, I'm like defining a nuanced Mormon 101 right now. And so, but that's, that argument still makes the church have plenty of very nuanced believers still makes the church very, very strong. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh yeah. It is. It is the only argument for, for, for staying in the church saying, this is my tribe. I enjoy the political power and the monetary power and the property and the fellowship and the friends. And I enjoy the fact that um, if I need to get um, welfare, we have our own shadow welfare system. I enjoy the fact that um, all of our temples and all of our property and all the money we donate is free from taxes. I enjoy the fact that we can set up our own little um, pseudo government inside the government. Yeah, those are all honest arguments um, for, for being part of the church. But but that's not what the church says about itself. You're talking about what nuanced people say. And it's an honest view and it's a quite cynical one. It's, it's really saying, I know that this is bullshit. I know this is all false. But I like being part of the winning team. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's just gross. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> I know. That's why uh, sometimes I argue with uh, 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 New Order Mormons and people trying to make their way in it more because it's like your your arguments. To, go back to pretending that, 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 that you don't have all this reified belief. And John, define reification. Just I want to... Make sure I understand the operational definition before I try and do one more illustration. Okay, so reification is all about ambigu ambiguity. You take an abstraction, a theory. Sometimes when you go look this up online, they'll always use the example of the map, which is, I think, leads people astray. And they don't, the, the, the idea of the map is reification would be um, confusing a map for the actual place, right? So you have a model of something, you have a a, um, a concept that has not been established. That that that's that's an important thing. If 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 something has been like become a theorem that's scientifically established, then we can build and start making conclusions from that. But when you have an abstract idea that doesn't have boundaries, that doesn't have definition, you can't really draw any conclusions from it because it's not it's not real in the first place. How would we know that to, to say that the orb floating in the air is a ghost 
implies a connection between the orb and the ghost, but there's been no ghost established. That's why they're hunting for them. So whatever evidence they're finding, until they establish that that evidence actually connects to ghosts, it's all just theater, which is what religion is. And I was, and I don't know if this is applicable, but I was just, I was thinking about how often it's easy for uh, Mormon apologetics and and non-believing Mormons to debate about horses and steel in the Book of Mormon. That's what I was going to say. When, yeah, when, when like we, we know that Adam and Eve weren't the first humans by science, and we know that the Tower of Babel didn't happen, and the whole Jaredite narrative depends on Adam and Eve and a Tower of Babel and a global flood with Noah. And so that kind of kills the whole Jaredite narrative in the Book of Mormon. But then also the whole Nephite narrative is also based on, um, you know, Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And we don't know if even Moses or Abraham existed. Uh, That really has not been established. In fact, even Jews don't, you know, secular or even let's just say educated Jews aren't even sure if Abraham or Moses really existed. So we're way down, we're way down the stack talking about whether Book of Mormon is historical when when all of the historical foundations that the Book of Mormon supposedly built on are in and of themselves completely fraught yeah. and problematic. Is that is that reification, John, or is that a different it's balance? definitely in there. Um uh and 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 oftentimes um reification leads to circular arguments because you use the conclusions to draw the proof. Again, our ghost hunters. I felt the cold spot and my mind became a stupor. And I thought in the, um, <laughs> the, the ghost hunter show I was watching, th- th- this shows how, how stupid human beings are, what I'm about to tell you. So for a lot of years, they would put up these boom mics in these supposedly haunted houses, right? And the audio quality was not great. So there was always static. And then in that, they'd say, oh, I heard a voice. Somebody said, danger. And then they'd play it over again on the tape. Uh, and, they, and then you'd have all this noise. And they would say, you see, you hear that? You hear that? You hear that? Somebody said, live. Well, the audio equipment has gotten too good. It doesn't have any static. So I am not shitting you, dear listener. They actually carry around static boxes with them now. And when they're searching for ghosts, they press play on the static box. And then when they go back and look at the tape, they listen for, they listen for the ghost talking amongst the static. Because that worked for them before until their audio equipment got, got too good. Again, this is this is from the, the assumption that there's even a ghost there in the first place. So so what, what, what Mormons will do is they'll put a concept in place They'll say, um, Joseph Smith was a prophet. Well, how do we know he was a prophet? Because he translated the Book of Mormon from the Golden Plates. Okay, well, how do we know the Golden Plates are real? Well, because Joseph Smith found them and he's a prophet. Well, how do we know he's a prophet? Because he translated them from the Golden Plates. It, it, it It leads to that circular reasoning, but the reason the circle is there is because both arguments depend on one another and neither of them are established. Neither of them have actually been proven and that's that's for me that's all i need to know that joseph smith is not a prophet because there isn't any external proof outside of him other than what he or his buddies have said so so once you start making conclusions based on the fact that joseph smith is a prophet i.e the entirety of mormon theology it's all fallacious it's all a fallacy which is why i'm always saying on this this it's all make-believe it's all a construction because it's built on concepts that aren't real or haven't been established as being real. Faith, hope, charity, those are all concepts that aren't defined. Even love, which we can attract to chemical um, stuff, is, is still a little bit fuzzy, right? So, so the problem is when you strip Mormonism away and start art taking back to its foundation, you come to a foundation that actually doesn't exist. Sorry, I keep striking the mic. It doesn't exist it is based on the the conclusions from assuming that conclusion is already there. Yeah, I love that ghost hunter uh, example because I think we can kind of all relate to that. That's kind of outside the scope of of Mormonism. And if you're able to have an outsider perspective, you can see these arguments. That's what it's so good about talking about 
like fallacious reasoning and uh, talking about it in a different context that's not as triggering for somebody who's religious. And what's funny is I mentioned that like I used to watch Ghost Hunters when I was like in eighth grade and I was so enthralled by it. And once I told my friend Paige, like they did this thing and like when the wires, when they cross these uh, wires like this, that's when there was a ghost there. And that's how you know there was a ghost there is when they crossed that. And she said to me, and she's like, they just said that's when there's a ghost there. Like we, that's not a known thing that like wires cross and do this on camera when ghosts are there. And I was like, oh, you're right. And now she's still Mormon and I'm not, but <laughs> you <know>. anyway, <laughs> but I love that example. Then the same one about Joseph Smith. Like if you, do you guys remember in the, like the gospel topics, topics essays, a lot of people have lost their testimony because we understand fallacious reasoning. Like we're not stupid. So when we see it in our face, like in the gospel topics essays, it'll say, uh, Joseph Smith used like this Urim and Thummim and he put a rock and a hat and a lot of past prophets have used different devices to be able to communicate with God and get revelations and everyone's like have they though have did Joseph what what did he ever actually get any communications what did he do with this stone oh he was a treasure digger with that did he ever find any treasure with it oh no he didn't like that screams to you that like the very premise that the church kind of is bringing awareness to of like do messages actually come through stones and hats though? And the church is just like, yeah, sure. Just ask like, you know, old prophets in the olden days. And everybody who reads the gospel topics essays that I know is like red alert, <laughs> red flags going off. You know, you just know that that's not right intuitively. Right. I think it's a great example. And it's why most people can't get out of the house of mirrors sure. because there is no exit to the house of mirrors. You have to smash the glass. Once you smash the glass, you can find your way out easily. But as long as you're accepting these premises that are actually conclusions that don't that don't actually have any argument behind them, they're just people who have asserted certain things. Uh, your example of hat rocks and hats is, is is fantastic because they use say, well, other prophets have done this. Well, um, can you find somebody who's not a prophet that that, that that does this, or is this just something that prophets? The prophets do. I've seen some charlatans do it. Like I've seen some people in like back alleyways who have like different card tricks. That like, that seems more familiar. Like Occam's razor again comes into play of like, is it more likely that he's a prophet or is it more likely that he's like a trickster? Because that is more what I'm I'm leaning towards. That seems like like the late least amount of conjecture needed tells me it's the the more nefarious one. Yeah, and and I think another uh, tell tell is that nobody ever gets convinced by these to join the church. <laughs> well, I, I can't say nobody. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking in superlatives. But when you talk to people who've converted to the church, it's usually like, yeah, I found I found a community um, when they were telling me about Joseph Smith and, and I felt really good. They took me to the temple and I felt peace there. Um, I suddenly had people who cared about my well-being. I've been able to uh, do a calling. I got off of heroin. I have a community. I'm going back to college. You know, you know, all, all that, all that stuff. But none of it has to do at all with the fact that Joseph Smith was a was a prophet that that that's just out there. Yeah, that's very true. We don't start with apologetics and work our way backwards very often. Correct. All right. Our next one. Argumentum ad ignorantium. Um, this is a very important one. This is the appeal to ignorance. Now. You, you probably feel like I'm going to make some kind of Dunning Kruger sort of thing or whatever. Uh, I'm not. This is a fallacy that says basically, if the argument has not been proven false, i.e., we're ignorant of why the argument is false, then the argument is true. That is a fallacy. Just not being able to disprove something or not having any evidence that it's not true, not untrue, is not evidence that is in fact true. Interesting. So the so the Let's see. Is there a way to restate that? Is it sort of the is it for the, sure the absence of evidence? The 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 a great example of this is the BYU professor who believes in the missing link of evolution. I've heard them say this to me themselves. They say it every quarter in classes, which is they will teach evolution, and then they will say at some point we are going to get some piece of knowledge that will connect these two theories. And all truth will be circumscribed into one great whole. That we're missing some critical piece of information. We're ignorant of some piece of information. Therefore, the argument might still be true. 
it's not it's not an argument at all. So so uh, or let's use the South America example. Everything we discover about the Inca and the Maya shows us that they are not the people described in the Book of Mormon. And and um, apologists who know what they're talking about will actually acknowledge that, but they will say we just haven't unburied it yet. The 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 proof of of the South American connection to the Book of Mormon is waiting there underneath some jungle. And some of them will make an argument. They say it'll happen right at the last days because it's important that it's all confusion and that the devil can run the world and we can't have proof that the church is true. So therefore, God has hidden this piece of information that will make everything connect together. Just because we do not have a proof that something is not true doesn't make it true. You'd have to somehow make it um, make some other argument to suggest that it, that it is true. And tell me the name again. What was the name of that one? This is the Argumentum Ad Ignorantium, or the Appeal to Ignorance. Is that similar to the God of the Gaps fallacy, or is it different? It is very much the God of the Gaps fallacy. Okay. That we don't know exactly what is going on here, but I'm going to chalk it up to it's got to be my deity. My deity did that. Well, Your deity did something else, but definitely mine is real. Kind of like yeah, yeah. And why something happened. And a stark naked view of that is I'm I'm asserting the truth that I've already accepted based on the fact that there hasn't been um, evidence disproving it on this aspect yet. Yeah. And but, I think so, that's, that's a good one for the outsider test for faith and things like that, where if you would accept that argument for your religion, but would you accept it for somebody else's religion? And I've posed this to my parents before who they had very like powerful, like they, my mom fasted for three days before she like joined the church before she really wanted to know it was true. And she said she had a very powerful, overwhelming, like shaking experience that the church was true. And I asked her though, but if somebody on the other side of the planet had a really strong, uh, like emotional reaction after fasting and they joined Islam or Buddhism or something else, like why we don't know the reason maybe maybe because they were fasting we don't know the reason that their body had that reaction but to chalk it up to that your deity is the absolute true one and then you're never going to let any other new inputs of information we just don't know the answer it's hard to assign an actual reason for it happening until we get more information is that kind of is that that yeah. well believers just pretend they believe stuff like that because you could go call your mom right now and say mom i have been fasting for three days I just met this guy named Bob, and I feel that I need to leave my my husband and my kids and go with Bob. And you could throw exactly the same validation that she used to arrive at the church is true. And there's no way she would say, you know what, you're right, because that's exactly how I, I determined the church was true. Like nobody accepts that as a valid measure. They all use it as a post hoc argument for why they why they did it. And, and and so I'm saying not only will I not accept the fact that you had an emotional experience that shows you the church is true, I'm saying that you won't accept it if 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 I use the exact same the exact same steps, everything you say to arrive at some conclusion you don't want me to, it is not convincing at all. Right, right. Yeah. If you arrive at something else besides the conclusion at the end of the day that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true, restored. If you have any other output, like I had a crazy emotional experience that tied me to this other deity. And actually the fruits of this new religion I'm following is twice as good. We give 50 times more to charity. My life is better. My marriage is better. And I had a spiritual experience to boot, like that told me that this is the way to go. If it doesn't end at the conclusion, your parents or whoever wants you to start with that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is the true one, it's invalid. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can see that the that kind of connectedness comes ev everywhere. Like um, soldiers in combat together, although they're in a miserable, hellish situation they'd never want to go back into, describe the relationship they have with their with their um, brothers in arms, their fellow soldiers, as almost, in almost quasi-spiritual language. This connection, this band of brothers, this sense of belonging that 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 is a product of our of our, our psychology. It's just the shysters come in and say, hey, that thing that you're feeling right now, that's the spirit. And you know what? I'm your bishop. And the spirit talks to me before he talks to you. And you know what? The spirit also tells me what you should do. Run. Mm -hmm. When somebody says that, run. Go run as fast as you can. But I, I want you to see those two things we just kind of talked about. The argumentum ad ignorantium, 
the 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 appeal to ignorance and reification between those two things you can construct ginormous walls of bullshit that you just circle back on itself you just keep making up definitions to new words you just keep doing things and 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 um no, and people just get their their minds just get so tangled like a taffy pole that they can't think straight. I was in that for thirty four years. I couldn't think straight. I I could think straight on things outside the church, but but these sort of things had my mind so twisted back on itself that, that it took it took years of study and careful understanding to to deprogram this shit. Because once you start. Like you take take your scriptures and take a red pencil, you know, like we used to, and then start crossing out every word that that is an, an argument from from the gaps, from the ignorance. It's an argument, it's reification, it's a it's the assuming properties of something that has never been established. And by the end of the day, you'll have redlined out 80% of that book. Yeah. And John, if I'm if I'm trying to kind of piece this together, like I'm thinking of a recent interview we did uh, with the Christian. Uh, I'm thinking Randy, where it seemed like when he was talking about the Big Bang, um, and oftentimes when Christians talk about like how incredible nature is, you know, how in the world can a bumblebee fly if its wings aren't you know robust enough to carry its weight, or how in the world did this universe just spring up from what appears to be nothing? Ergo, there must be a God, and that's God of the gaps. But, but so much, or, or even if um, somebody, you know, is healed, let's just say someone's sick and they say a prayer or their parents say a prayer, and then the person gets better. The truth is, we haven't really done any analysis to figure out what actually made the person get better. It may have been time, it may have been uh, something they ate, it may have been some other factor that we aren't aware of. But we we too easily just jump to God or faith uh, as the explanation. But then from there, uh, once you've made that jump that there is a supreme being and that he created all things and that he's looking over us, and then you can also get people to um, just accept wholesale the creation narrative and the Old Testament and thus the New Testament, you can get people debating about, well, how in the world can the Book of Mormon, if how in the world could Joseph Smith or an uneducated farm boy have manufactured that book from scratch? And you can get people arguing about the details of the book when the truth is that's sitting upon this massive foundation that's built of both beginning with the God of the gaps and then a lot of false principles stacked on top of each other via reification such that you get people arguing about the bark on a tree and they can never step back and actually see that the forest is actually false or manufactured um, because they're too busy arguing about the bark on, on one of the trees. Is that exactly? Yeah. Is that kind of, is that a way, is that illustrating at all what you're trying to say? Yeah. The whole thing's a clusterfuck and it's just, <laughs> it's just a mess and our minds are messy. Our minds are really messy. And, and these things are not like this evil person's tool case. These are, flaws in our brain chemistry that we've identified over the last few thousand years. And if you're a shyster, if you're selling something, you want something from people, you use these things. Uh, we, we, we use them just all the time um, to manipulate one another incessantly. We use them against our children. We use them against our spouses. We use them against our parents. We're very manipulative. We're very deceptive as a species. And, and you have to very carefully unpack all this stuff because you know, it, your, 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 your example is pretty good, but you're still talking about trees, which I can go walk into and I can lick one and I can put my hand on it. But really, religious people are talking about like midi chlorians and stuff like that. Yeah. They're always just talking about nonsense. That's why I, I find like theology to be really hard to study uh, because it's all just nonsense on nonsense on nonsense on nonsense. Yeah. And to that point, like 
the bigger picture of why we do so many of the things that we do in Mormon stories. And the point that we're trying to explain here, to me at least, is the bigger picture is that these ideas that people are trapped with and have ramifications, have ramifications if you have your Mormon parents and your you know 16-year-old son comes out as gay. Like the way people treat one another is locked within these logical fallacies. And I get really annoyed and have a lot. I have empathy for people who are stuck in these, but also at the end of the day, I get really annoyed too because like John... Larson just said, like, these are some ancient ideas about, we're talking about angels, we're talking about ancient prophets affecting the way that, like, gay people get treated today, and we're locking ourselves on a train that's being, like, steered by some, like, Stone Age philosophy? Like, are we kidding ourselves here? Like, we know we don't put up with these fallacies in so many other areas. We can recognize them when it's not our religion that's being talked about. So let's do talk about our faith. Let's talk about our faith, our politics, our everything, if it affects the way that we treat people, the way we vote, the way we are citizens in this world. So it's just, I just want a thousand foot view, 10,000 foot view. This stuff is really important. Yeah. And, I, and I'll add to that, Kara. That was great. And I'll add to it. When I hear, you know, uh, Farms and Maxwell Institute and Fair Mormon apologists arguing for a limited geography theory against Rodney Meldrum and the Heartland theory um, apologists arguing for a large geography Book of Mormon theory that incorporates North, Central, and South America. What comes to my mind is arguing about whether hobbits can can kill elves or dwarves and who's stronger harry potter uh or or iron man uh because it's all it it all seems to be uh almost like comic-con absurdity you know who's stronger uh, hulk or thor and can hulk smash thor or can thor's hammer smash hulk mm -hmm. and it's all kind of silliness because it's all built on superstitious foundations that have no, have never established, not even that there's a God, let alone that Moses and Abraham lived, let alone that Jesus lived, let alone that Jesus was resurrected, let alone that, that an angel delivered gold plates to Joseph, let alone that there were ever Nephites and Lamanites, let alone that there was ever either one or two hills of Camorra. The only evidence we have is that this life is real <laughs> that we're actually living this one and you could probably love a lot of the people around here better if you destructed destructed uh deconstructed some of these ideas but anyway well i i think that's that's a a, a great example john and um i, I the last couple of years we, we saw something quite incredible happen um you know when when um covid unleashed itself on on the world um what we saw is the a, a really amazingly quick um arrival at the vaccine it was very quick in terms of calendar time in actuality if you add up person hours the amount of work that was done there was um it's it's but, but I've, I've talked to some scientists and people who are involved there's probably the best researched quickest most collaborative vaccine effort ever on the place on the face of the planet and why this is important is that you could take Chinese scientists, Russian scientists, American scientists, and European scientists, and they all spoke the same language, even though they spoke literally different languages. They came from world views that were very different, but they were sharing the genome sequencing. They were collaborating. They were publishing their 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 um, their work faster than they normally do. There was just this huge amount of collaboration. Um, I think when future generations tell the story of COVID, it'll be this this miraculous triumph of science. Let's compare that to Rodney Meldrum. If you took somebody who was not schooled in Mormonism, but knew very, was, was a scholar of, of, of the ancient American peoples, the Aboriginal Americans, they would have no fucking clue what Rodney's talking about at all. It's just, it's just all of this imaginary, like you say, it's, it's Thor versus Loki. Um, it is, it is, it is, it's not based in any kind of science, but he presents it wrapping himself in the language of science, wrapping himself in the language of history, as if this is something that's not just fiction. But the fact that it's not communicatable to anybody who's not already in that paradigm shows that the paradigm is probably not true. 
In this case, no, probably. It is absolutely not true. Yeah. 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 This is a okay. We're tough, John. Yeah, go ahead. No, keep going. Did, All go right. I've got one last fallacy uh, for tonight. For tonight. Okay. This is the definist, D E F I N I S T fallacy. Um, this is basically uh, uh, insisting that your definition of a word is the correct one. <laughs> it, it, it is actually a kissing cousin um, um, to, to reification. Because what you do is, is you define out the term the way you want it to be. And then from there, you can make, you can make arguments. My, uh, my dear wife uh, teaches English in school and she always has to well when she was in utah she always had to unpack a certain term and that term is virtue because the students in utah who grew up in mormon culture believe virtue is about sex sex so Sorry. the church has redefined the word virtue the virtue word virtue came from the the greeks and they wrote about it quite a bit for them virtue the greeks um had four aspects of it temperance, prudence, courage, and justice. Now, one could argue that temperance, um, uh, sex falls under temperance, but the Greeks believed in moderation. So teetotaling would be foreign to the, to the Greek concept of virtue. So, so, so Mormons have def redefined a word, and then they go and they talk out in the world using the word virtue, but they've got their own special definitions for it that are packed up. And this is kind of the one I want to finish off with this because it's a it's a it's a it's a trick that uses a lot of the other tricks we've already talked about. It's a straw man. It, 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 you, you take and, and define the words exactly the way you want, and you cut out any of the messiness around the edges. It is this uh, oftentimes reification where you're taking concepts that are not proven; they're just theoretical, and then you're packing them into language and speaking about them as if they're concrete um, re realities. Um, Oftentimes, your your um, yeah, yeah, that's good. that's good enough. So 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 the, the the church does it with all their tiny little definitions that they define things out, like the word apostate, which is funny when I read this article and you see all the weasel language they start throwing in here as they create their own wink and nod definitions. Apostates sometimes become enemies of the church. That's true, but. So does the church become enemies of the Catholic Church? So here, here we're using words. We're we're putting definitions. Apostasy, then they were implying, is somebody who is an enemy of the church. But can we say Mormons are Catholic apostates? Because that would fill their definition of that. Um, because Mormonism is specifically and categorically against Catholicism and working to overturn Catholicism. Literally, we love sending missionaries to Catholic countries in particular to try to get them to abandon their Catholic faith. Are Mormons the enemies of Catholicism? I ask you. Yes, but they don't want to admit that these days. I agree. Leaving the church, which claims to be God's official church. God's official church? Who, who cares that the church claims to be God's official church? I punched Larry in the face, who claims to be the reincarnation of Vishnu. Who cares? Like, what does that have to do with my fist? Like, you, you see you see the kind of sleight of hand they're doing. Leaving the church which claims to be God's official church, containing the fullness of the gospel. Why is that clause even in this sentence? Because they're trying to establish through definition without defining. Because remember, I told you this is written by PhDs. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to do the same thing lawyers do. They state things to try to get those words next to each other in your mind. Um, containing the fullness of the gospel often results in feelings of guilt. I just threat, cut that up. Let me read it one more time. Leaving the church, which claims to be God's official church, contain, containing the fullness of the gospel often results in feelings of guilt. So so, so, so what? Uh, we, we put guilt in all sorts of people. There's people who feel guilty if they eat before anybody else does. There's people who feel guilty because we're chopping down the Amazon rainforest. There's people who feel guilty because they're driving around a car that burns gas. That has no bearing on anything that, that, that ex-Mormons feel guilty. And I'll tell you one thing. If there's one thing I do know about Mormons is that they feel guilty about stuff all the time. 
While many return, others develop a need to defend their actions. So what Mormons do is not defending their actions. That's what apostates do. While many return, others develop a need to defend their actions, disprove they have in quotes the church, or become hostile enemies. Well, aren't Mormons themselves trying to disprove apostasy? Isn't that what they're doing right here? Why is disproving the church a sin, but disproving apostasy is not a sin? Why are we apostates enemies, but they're not enemies to us? They're, they're playing all these fallacy games and, and they're, they're throwing all this stuff in. The fruits of apostasy are generally bitter. If, if I had a PhD candidate, whoever, whoever fucking wrote this, and they put that in, in their thing, they'd be immediately kicked out of the program, right? Why? That sentence right there, right there, the fruits of apostasy are generally bitter. That's just sophistry. There's nothing in there that has any ring of truth. It's just pure vile. It's just saying things that are mean. It does nothing in there means anything. There's no Mormon definition of bitterness or or being vile, right? I mean, or whatever. The the, the fruits of ge are, are generally bitter. There's nothing in there. The bitterness has to do with with leaving the the church. They're just using negative connotation to put a negative stink on ex Mormons. They're they're doing a straw man here. They're doing they're using language. They're doing everything they can to not actually say anything in here. When you get done reading this, who are they talking about? They're talking about no ones. They're talking about everyone. The Book of Mormon warns of unfavorable conditions that result from transgression contrary to light and knowledge. What's light? What do you mean light? What are you talking about? Define your terms. They won't. Yeah. Anyway, I just I, just, I read that paragraph because you can see these things in there. And if we were to go on for another 50 fallacies, you'd see them just interweaving these, these, these um, blankets of fallacy which is so hard for, for people who are really seeking truth. I've told you before, I, I have no religion other than I seek truth. And if you can prove me wrong, I will admit it. That's all I care about is what is real, what is true. And, and this stuff here that we read from the church is as far away from truth, basically, as you can get. Yeah, definitely isn't loving. We'll start there. <laughs> Everyone knows the re it's just it's dumb divisive language to even put that in there they could have just said apostates are people who leave the church the end but that's not advantageous right. to their goals which is to demonize and put us versus them othering language in there that's not loving everyone knows everyone is every mormon knows somebody who left the church church hey lds church why what ad what is advantageous to you to demonize people who leave i can guess a few it's not helpful and loving and it's not christ like and it's not what christ taught and it is tearing families apart. Well, that that goes back to the ad hominem fallacy because they want to attack people who leave the church to discredit them, because the most dangerous, you know, the the danger the most dangerous person to an organization is someone who used to be a part of that organization and who can speak from an insider perspective about what's going wrong inside. Sure. It's it's the it's kind of the reverse of the bandwagon effect. The bandwagon effect is, hey, everybody's doing it, so I want to join if everybody's doing it. Well, if everybody's leaving and having a bad experience with it, then a lot of people are going to want to leave like rats fleeing a sinking ship. And so they need to defame. I mean, the, the, you know, apostates are literally the most dangerous um, people, threats to an organization. So they've got to use the ad hominem uh, fallacy to try and save their own tail. Well, yeah. Go ahead, Kara. I was just going to say, what's the fallacy of our TikTok getting taken down? <laughs> that now we can't even talk on TikTok anymore. If you guys don't know, our TikTok's been down for a while. We might not get it back, but we might. But yeah, just to John's credit, just to his point, that it's really rough when we have letting people tell their own stories in their own words is just, it is too problematic for a trillion dollar church. So they're having this little thing out of this studio just always trying to let not let people speak their truth. You know, that's just the way, only way that it's going to continue. But John Larson. John, I, I was going to just say really quickly, 
isn't another just classic example? Well, I can think of two, one you don't like and one you may like a little more. <laughs> We've talked a lot about how the church was finding horses in the Book of Mormon to be inconvenient. And so they tried to redefine horse to potentially include the possibility of a taper. And that was just one theory that was advanced. But I also, um, I've heard them try and redefine terms like steel um, uh, to, or sword to be other types of relics that they were able to find in Mesoamerica during the time of the Book of Mormon. So those are some examples that, John, you may not be big fans of. The, the, I think the classic apologetic example of redefining terms is now that now that it's clear that Joseph failed on four translations, four scriptural translations Joseph Smith failed on. He failed. Uh, the Book of Mormon is clearly not a translation because uh, it's just clearly a 19th century document. And nobody, even, even now, Bushman and, and Mason and Givens, you know, all of the modern neo-apologists are going to agree that the Book of Mormon looks a lot more like a 19th century document than anything ancient and Mesoamerican. So that's kind of failure number one on Joseph Smith. Failure number two, translation scripture of Joseph Smith is the Book of Abraham. Uh, we all know that that's no longer a translation. Uh, the um, Joseph Smith translation of the New Testament has now been found to be a forgery of uh, the Adam Smith commentary. And then if that weren't enough, the Kinderhook plates are also a false translation because Joseph tried to describe what those plates were when it turns out that um, people trying to fool Joseph Smith manufactured fake plates so they could expose him as a charlatan. So there's four failures in Joseph Smith's ability to translate. So what do apologists do, John Larson? Are, are you Have you been plugged in lately to see how they're, how they're uh, solving this translation problem? Uh, no, no. What, what do they have a new one? Yeah, they're changing. They're changing. They had, when I was at Utah State University, um, they had an entire two day academic professional conference at an R1 division one major research university about what the word translation means. And maybe the word translation, maybe what Joseph said he was translating he was meaning something else. And Richard Bushman went to Harvard. Terrell Givens was like, you know, as a professor, you know, he went to, I don't know, Syracuse or Cornell, somewhere fancy. They've got people like Jana Reese and, and Patrick Mason and all these scholars that, that call themselves intellectuals up there trying to redefine the term yeah. translation uh, because it's become really inconvenient. Kara. I just wanted to say one of my favorite, I have a, I have this tweet saved on my desktop. I love it so much from a Mormon, probably a Desmet person on Twitter. They tweeted, what if God used Joseph Smith's imagination to create the Book of Mormon, but Joseph Smith thought it was an ancient document? That's a real thing. Jeez, don't swear, Kara, don't swear. But that's a real thing that a Mormon thought and was like holding on so tightly to. And they thought that that idea deserved to go off to the internet. That is how fallacious reasoning is, and people do not recognize it. You would never put up with that with, like, Muhammad. <laughs> you never put up with that with, like, Jim Jones, but you put up with that with Joseph Smith, but his imagination is just so pure. He could, he didn't just, like, marry, you know, 40 women because he felt like it. It was because we're going to start back from the presupposition that the church is true and everything's always going to lead into that. You need to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are all right. Uh, it's it's it, it's exactly. Go ahead, John. And John, one other example that, that you may have missed as you were actually enjoying life in your post post Mormon life. There was this uh, audio recording that I got in my hands a few years ago, where this couple, uh, Brooke and Josh, uh, my friends, went to Spencer Fluman of the Maxwell Institute. He's still the head of the Maxwell Institute, and. Privately, Spencer Fluman is acknowledging that the Book of Mormon looks a lot more like a 19th century document than it does a translation of ancient Mesoamerican records. And what Spencer Fluman tells my friends Josh and Brooke are that maybe the Book of Mormon wasn't Joseph Smith's grandest translation. It was Joseph Smith's grandest revelation. So the church is actually moving in the direction of no longer referring to the Book of Mormon as a translation, but instead as a revelation. And that when Joseph Smith said translation, he meant revelation, which is also the catalyst theory 
which is that maybe when Joseph Smith said he was translating Egyptian papyrus into what is now the Book of Abraham, <laughs> what he really was doing was he was revealing God's that the <laughs> that the that the papyrus inspired Joseph to channel revelation from God. Hey, are these things that are new to you, John? Why are you laughing? I made John Larson there's, laugh. Tara. There's better discussions on the Battlestar Galactica forums. I swear. Okay. These these so-called professors. Yeah, I'm calling you fuckers out. These so-called professors, there's three tracks in their life. There's fast and testimony meeting. There's scholarly peer-reviewed articles. Journal. Journals. Yeah. And then there's this weird, bastardized, fucked up, apologetic space where they all play slap and tickle with each other. Okay? <laughs> you find me one of those motherfuckers that they're that they're oh, listen, watch your language. Oh, he gets that, it. <laughs> that yeah. their testimony okay. matches what they put in peer-reviewed um journals. One of them. And then I'll listen to them. But they're full of it. They don't even even the ones that you like, like Terrell Givens, I guarantee you he doesn't get up in testimony meeting and say all the stuff that he puts in his books. That is this this echo chamber to slough off the intelligent people. No, I'm who, no I'm no longer. I mean, Terrell and Fiona, I hear love can be lovely people. And I'm private. sure they're great people. But I'm, I'm sure not, all, all these professors. I'm calling names. I'm sure I would enjoy their company. I'm sure they're lovely human beings. I'm saying professionally, socially, and religiously, they are morally bankrupt. And I'm showing you how because their life is a church and their profession. And then they have this third thing, right? And that's what we're talking about. That's why I'm laughing. We're talking about this, this group masturbation, these circle jerks that they do. But I want to see it bookmarked by what they say in, they say in church. And what they say in the peer reviewed journals, or, because they're just playing games. Or, what do you think about this example? For instance, last week uh, we had Sandra Tanner on, and then we're having her on again this week. And we went through a podcast that John, by the way, and Hank Smith, yeah, and church historian Kate Holbrook. They did a two-part series about Joseph's polygamy, and we found it really frightening and problematic that they left out every single thing that could be deemed problematic about the way Joseph's practiced polygamy, about all of the more uncomfortable parts of Section 132. And we know that they know that they're leaving everything out, and they know that we people at Mormon Stories and whoever else is going to look at that and call them out, but they do it anyway to the kind of like to your circle jerk point is like, if we don't hold them accountable, sorry for being like dirty, rotten apostates. Like if we don't do it at some point, nobody's going to, because you guys talked about this on a podcast for three hours and you didn't mention all of the problems with 132. You only highlighted the ones that make you feel kind of warm and fuzzy. And that just reminds me, like they know the information they know that that's that they know that they're technically lying by withholding the truth. And then they also get mad at apostates for sounding bitter because we're just kind of holding your feet to the fire that you know better and should do better. That's my biggest frustration. They're well, religious people. They do what religious people do. If religion were true, we'd call it science. So uh, people who pursue truth are called scientists. People who pursue falsehood are called religious. So, we 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 we're kind of in the circle jerk too because we keep pointing out these guys keep doing this thing over and over again. What do we expect them to do? It's in their nature. If they if they were if they were students of truth, they would leave the church. They wouldn't stay in. These aren't people who care about truth. Also, they care about being right. They care about being on the winning team. Sorry, John, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, and they care about reinforcing the church's authority and and they care about their jobs and they care privilege about their and status and all that. Yeah, yeah, but, but and. And that's so offensive to someone like Patrick Mason or Richard Bushman or Terrell Givens to say that they're not sincere. Like they would say, Hey, John Larson, I, I will give you credit that, that you're sincere. We're not just, you know, uh, bought off by our jobs or our status. We actually also give us the, give us the respect of assuming our sincerity, just like we're willing to assume you're sincere. So they don't like it. They, they, 
it is uh, it is reasonable that they don't like it when we call into question their motives. Or call them MFers. Yeah, and by the way, John's going to and, and by the way, by the way, isn't that ad hominem? Like, don't we have to be careful as ex Mormons not to discredit Richard Bushman or Terrell Givens or Fiona Givens or Patrick Mason or Spencer Fluman? Because aren't we attacking the person when we say that that their their motives How aren't did he pure? Attack the person? Thank you for bringing that up, John. Let's go back to the beginning. Fallacies only occur when one is making an argument, one is making an assertion. So these guys have all these um, magical assertions they're making. I'm not making any assertion. I have no constraint. I don't have to follow any kind of, um, all I have to do is disprove their, their logical fallacies. And then I disprove their position. So, so if I say, hey, that guy over there is a jerk, it's not a fallacy. If I said, hey, that guy over there, you can't trust his quote on re-roofing my house because he's a jerk, that's a fallacy. But if but if Richard Bushman and Terrell Givens and Patrick Mason, if they're trying to argue the church is true and the Book of Mormon is historical, and then we say, no, but their their reputations and their income are tied to their positions, aren't we undermining their arguments? by calling into question their character and their integrity and their sincerity? I think I'm giving them an out. You, yeah. you, you're saying they're sincere, and I'm saying it's not helping their case. You're, you're saying, okay, there's these guys out here who went to Ivy League schools who are professors forever. They've read all this stuff. They know all the stuff, but they sincerely want to lean into the lie. Then... My assassinating their character is better than my assassinating their intelligence, isn't it? Because either either they're they're are, 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 so John, are you saying they're stupid? That's what I'm hearing. You're saying they're not smart enough to figure it out. Because that's why I call them names, because I say they are smart enough to figure it out. I say I've read Bushman. I know that guy's got a brain on him. And I know he's he's arrived at a, a conclusion that's not supported by his own arguments. Yeah. Bring it, bring him on with me. Well, we'll talk. Yeah. The, the other thing, John. I won't call them names. Right, right, right. And they won't come on because that's one of the sign of a really weak argument is Patrick Mason or Spencer Fluman or Richard Bushman will say they don't come on Mormon stories because our tone has changed, because we're too negative, because we're too critical. Yeah, bullshit. Image. Like, ugh, they're just so annoying. So, what? okay. So they they were academics in, in, the, in the Ivy League. And they're too tender-hearted to come on to like a two-bit podcast. No, they have everything to lose. This is why they won't come on. They have everything to lose and nothing to gain. They will win nothing by arguing with me. Yeah. But they know about like forty-five. They don't. They don't care about. It. They don't know who I am. But people like me, we we have we have eight hundred ways to decimate their arguments, and they have nothing to stand on. Nothing. So they 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 go into their their holy sepulchers. They go into their chapels. They, they, they talk in places where they can't be touched. They, they retire, you know. Look at all the stuff John Gee has written in, in um, journals about Egyptian Egyptology. He doesn't have any. They won't publish him. All right, let me ask you a question then, Phil Larson, because yeah. we do have a very interesting apologist that does come in. We had Rodney, Rod Meldrum on like last week, and we're having him again. This yeah, you know, I, I, I chatted what? up with Rod a couple of years ago. He's a nice guy. Uh, he and I would have great beers together. Yeah, if he if only, but yeah. but so to the I just want to mention the opposite point. There are some people who I think Rod obviously has very very weak arguments, and I'll tell him that to his face. Um, and I will point them out at dinner, and I will say that that is a uh, non sequitur saying to me, Rod, that like we know that uh, Nephi built a ship because Phoenicians built ship. That is not helping. Uh, he told me also like. We know that Nephi built a ship because his brothers in the Book of Mormon said, Nephi, you can't build a ship. Aha, they knew what ships were. So I'll tell him to his face that his arguments are fallacious, but that doesn't change anything. He's still going to come back on another right. day. So what am I supposed to do with that? I can point out his fallacious arguments to his face all day, every day. It's never going to change his mind. Well, and, and um, thank you, John, for ca calling me out. I'm, I'm, I am I'm crossed the line. I did. Um I shouldn't I shouldn't be dropping names like that. Um I I get angry not because of them. I get angry because of the damage they cause. 
because they use that 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 education they have they use those credentials to to then um fool a lot of people who get hurt by this whole thing mormonism is very destructive psychologically for people inside now you know when you were you were talking about why does the church vilify ex-mormons because they vilify mormons too like, why do you have to get a new temple recommend every two years? Why do you have to go to a tithing settlement? Why do you have to constantly repent? Why do you have to confess your sins to the church? Listen to the way the church talks to its members. It doesn't like ex-Mormons. It doesn't trust ex-Mormons because it doesn't like Mormons. The whole point of the whole thing is that you're all worms, and you all can't survive in life without us, and you'd all be broken and rapey and dead in a ditch if it weren't for the church. The church doesn't respect any of us. So it's the fact that these guys are using whatever intellectual power they have to promote this system, this destructive, terrible, harmful system. It needs to go away, and they need to stop. And what they're doing is serious, which is why I come back to them with serious words. What they're doing matters. It's not just like, oh, everybody's just trying their best. They're not trying their best. It's not easy to publish a book. It takes a lot of work. So you don't get a free pass of just saying, Oh, well, he's just sharing his view with the world. Yeah. And John, I'll, um, go, going back to not only do they not publish their stuff in incredible peer reviewed journal, uh, journals or testimony. Uh, yeah. Not only do they not come on, uh, any appear anywhere where critics could actually ask them credible questions. What they what we also have is kind of, um, private speak and public speak. It's, um, because what Spencer Fluman's willing to say to a couple who's lost their testimony behind closed doors in his office, what Terrell and Fiona Givens are willing to say um, when they're at a special fireside that is limited people in attendance where there's no recorders being made, what Richard Bushman's willing to say in a basement at a Faith Again uh, you know, get-together in Salt Lake City where he makes the comment, that uh that you know the pre prevailing narrative uh is is incorrect that it's not true that it's broken and that the brother need to come up with a new prevailing narrative whenever you actually record what they're saying in private and then share it publicly they they go bananas they lose and they tell you that it's mean and rude to record them in private how dare you share something that was that was recorded um, and meant for a private audience. And anytime you've got that double speak where you're not willing to say publicly what you're clearly willing to say privately, it, it usually is a pretty good indication that you're um, not standing on solid ground. And that, and, and this is John, you could tell us about what happened when during the Smoot hearings, when they asked uh, Joseph F. Smith as he was a prophet, do you want to remind us what, what he said? <laughs> His tone was much more subdued. They asked him about revelation and if he talks to God and all that kind of stuff. And he kind of just weaseled out of it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. 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 And, and another, another example is when Gordon Mehinkley is doing interviews, I guess, leading up to the Salt Lake Olympics and they're asking him about polygamy and he says, it's not doctrinal. And they ask him about theosis what about men becoming gods because the God makers became inconvenient. And he's like, well, we don't, we I don't, don't know that. that we teach that. I don't know, I that, we teach don't. It. I don't know that we emphasize it. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, and then immediately when the Mormon world loses its mind because of Sunstone, then when Gordon B. Hinckley's at the very next general conference, he does that wink and a nod to the Mormon audience and says, you all know that I'm not confused about the doctrine and everybody laughs uh, there's there's kind of that double speak, and it's it's just a clear indication that they're speaking one way to one audience when it matters that they're uh, wanting to sound intellectual, wanting to sound credible in front of their academic or or social or or world peers, global peers. They're going to say a whole bunch of different things than what they're going to say in private. Yep. And yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, and, and that privacy thing, I'm going to read you the first sentence of this apostate definition again. Members of the church vary in their levels of participation or belief. Latter-day Saints, Latter Saints who have seriously um, contravened or ignored cardinal church teachings 
public or privately, are considered apostate, apostates, <laughs> whether or not they have officially left the church or affiliated with another religion. So they specifically say in there, you can be an apostate for something you've been told in private. That's not even the doctrine of the church. I mean, doesn't that, that, that should scare the bejesus out of everybody. Also, isn't it weird that Joseph Smith would not, he'd be considered an apostate. He doesn't follow any of the rules of modern Mormonism. He wouldn't even recognize this church. <laughs> like, well, uh, he's a, he's a mystic. Mystics, mystics are not. They're allowed to. Yeah. They're allowed to. Yeah. Yeah. So. Let, 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 let me give you a chance to repent a little bit. Terrell Givens, by his own hand, is a great book. Um, I would recommend people people read it the, before he, he wrote some of the other stuff. It's a fantastic believing and sympathetic approach to the problem of apostasy and how to deal with apostasy. He showed a lot of love and compassion for those who struggle. And I have to give him props for that. And I, I probably bust his ass too much here on this on this show. Uh, Bushman um, um, was a great scholar, and I enjoyed his works before Rough Stone Rolling more than I enjoyed Rough Stone Rolling, which was just kind of boring to me. But the work that he did after that, I I thought um, dishonored his previously scholarly work. But but he's got great chops, a great understanding. And, and I would recommend to anybody in the church, apostate or not, to read what he's written. Who else did I slag? Rodney Meldum, he seems like a great guy. He's trying to make this whole nonsense work. But, but um, I'm, sure, I'm, sure he's, I'm sure he's a kick at a party. He seems like a fun guy. I complimented him on his fundamentalism, actually, because he's more of a literalist with the text, which is fair enough. Like, that's what it says. That's what you believe. You're not weaseling out of it. Like, it's interesting. I have a little dog. His name is Mo, and he's an asshole. And he's like eight pounds of of, of fury. But Mo does no. He's 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 a loving dog. Except if anybody, if people start actually yelling at each other for real, or if anybody looks like there's never been like violence in my house. But like if if like one of the kids will grab another kid, he will run up and bite them. He is violently opposed to violence. <laughs> and I'm I'm going to make my um my uh, re repentant appeal. That's what gets me going. It's the people in power who prey, even inadvertently, on on people who are in sta stages of of weakness, despair, need, all that kind of stuff. That's why I get so angry at these guys because of what it does to so many people in the church. But um. They are human beings, and they are deserving of kindness and compassion too. So, so please, dear listener, forgive me for, for for going after them. I just get so frustrated with what they're doing because it doesn't make any sense to me. It, because they have to know, they have to know what they're doing, and that's what irks me. That's what I want to ask them. People will think if I was there with them, I'd be like, "What about this? What about this?" I would just be like, "How do you make this work?" How do you make this reconcile with this? How do you do this with this? You know? Yeah. Uh, let me read Cherish's comment. I thought was great. They said, why am I not surprised that John has a dog that's an asshole? Too funny. <laughs> Too funny. We, we, we're attracted to each other. Hmm. All right. Is that well, a non sequitur or is it? <laughs> me and Mo, we're cut from the same. <laughs> All right. Well, John, uh, if I can summarize uh, today, uh, what I heard is um, we, we as ex-Mormons, as believing Mormons, as Orthodox Mormons, we need to uh, ground ourselves, ground our arguments in logic, and we need to avoid falling prey to logical fallacies. And some of them are um, ad hominem, attacking the person instead of uh, addressing the argument. Straw man, setting up a fake argument that an opponent doesn't hold and then knocking it down as if you have uh, accomplished something when you've actually just mischaracterized your opponent's argument. There's the no true Scotsman, which is kind of a purity argument. It's kind of like whenever a Republican says something Trump doesn't like, he calls him a rhino or a, or a Republican in name only. That's an example of a... No true Scotsman. Reification is building um, building on ambiguity a sort of a, a logical or a rational tower of Babel that really is built on air as a foundation. 
such that the more detailed arguments you're making are, are standing upon nothing. Uh, be a, beware of, uh, of doing that. And arguing from absence, don't do that. Don't do the gap argument where there is no explanation, ergo, fill in the, uh, fill in the gap with your favorite mystic or supernatural or ex-Mormon apostate explanation. Don't do that. And uh, don't, don't uh, redefine words. Don't fall prey to the definist fallacy where you're basically just reinventing the human language, English language or whatever language, language it is you speak. If you have to reinvent and redefine words to make your argument hold water, you probably have a weak argument. What, what a great what, summary. We should have just listened to this. We could have, <laughs> we could have saved two hours, John. What, did I miss any big ones? Did I miss any big ones? No, I think that's a good sum up. We did a couple other corner cases, but but, but yeah, I, I think thinking is hard. This stuff is, is hard. It takes work. That's why most of us don't want to do it. It's yeah. not very fun. Yeah. yeah. I think also, obviously, ideas in our brain, if they're serving us, then your brain will find reasons to keep up holding them. I did that for 30 years. And so until you have to pick a side where suddenly those ideas of Mormonism are hurting me, my family, the people that love me, when people say you looked for reasons to leave the church, it was like, I saw that it wasn't serving me the way that it used to. And it just so happens that I started to notice the logical fallacies more obviously than I did before. And so when people say, you know, maybe that's a fallacy in of itself that you're looking for reasons. I was like, I was just more hyper aware to the fallacies is pretty much what losing my faith in Mormonism came down to. Well, it's, it's, we've talked about it before. It's a house of cards, which is why people talk about an epiphany moment when it starts to fall apart, because you have all these assumptions you have to keep in your head. And once you question those key assumptions, as the great Tal Bachman once said, is, is all you have to do is allow yourself to question that it may not be true. And for most people, that's enough. Yeah. Right on. Beautiful. Well, all John, right, uh, it's so great to have you back in the saddle. We're glad uh, that we didn't lose you and your appearances on Mormon Stories podcast just from your move. We're really grateful again to Gerardo for helping us get you set up. And we 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 apologize to our live stream viewers that we had those technical glitches at the beginning. We'll keep refining our process and we'll we'll add to our checklist some things to make sure that uh, we we try to not repeat any of these errors. Um, but having said that, and, and having said that, we promised you guys, you all, that we would have some call in. It's kind of late, and we we don't. We, we Karen needs to get to bed, and so. Um, and can I, I maybe propose a a, a a planned call in show where people can write the people who don't want to be on the phone can write questions or whatever? Yeah, yeah. We we need to figure out that mailbag, as well. like a mailbag segment. Yeah, so. and sometimes we can set up like a voicemail where actually people can leave oh, voice. Love it voice mail or or video mail and then we can actually play their their audio or their their video clips hey we did a call-in show together in 2010 do you remember that that was 12 years ago i do we've come a long way baby i was mm -hmm. 14 years old just kidding. <laughs> yeah just kidding no you're not oh no, well yeah we'll get the bugs worked out thanks everybody for their patience i'm i've got a lot of my books unpacked i'm excited to uh to dive into some weird corner of some mormonism again Excellent. Yeah. Well, thanks, John. It's great to have you. Thanks. You're always a treat and you're well loved in our community. So it's an honor to have you here. I'll also just uh, remind our audience that we have set up a fund to pay for John Larson. And so if you value, we, we pay John Larson a thousand dollars an episode, uh, just like we do Simon Southerton out of respect for their expertise and their knowledge. And we need your donations to support that. So if you have donated to the Mormon Expression John Larson Fund, great. If you haven't, please go to mormonstories.org slash Mormon Expression. There's a donate button there. We'll include that in the show notes, and maybe Kara or Jen will include that now in the comments. But uh, if, you, if you become a monthly donor to the Mormon Expression Fund, not only will that fund John Larson coming regularly, it'll fund his equipment and maybe his broadband if we need to increase that it also funds us being able to maintain the Mormon Expression podcast library, um, which we have worked with John to help put up now 
um, on, uh, on the internet. So for those of you who don't know, John Larson did this amazing multi-year Mormon themed podcast that literally has some of the best Mormon themed discussions ever, whether it's word of wisdom, DNC 132, Nauvoo expositor, or how to build a transoceanic vessel. If you want some amazing uh, Mormon themed content, check out the Mormon expression podcast. And we will also include a link to that in our show notes that Jen and or Kara are adding to. Um, so, so please become a monthly donor uh, to, to John Larson and to the Mormon expression initiative. And we'll get many, many more months of John Larson goodness. Is there anything you want to add to that, John? No, uh, the, the world costs money. And um, that's for most of us, it's the only thing we have to in, influence things around. So you need to decide where your money is going to go and what kind of things you want to support. This sort of stuff is hard. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of energy. And um, if you want quality, um, then you need to you need to pay something. Um, I, don't, I don't know what to me. It's sort of obvious. There's this weird ex-Mormon thing um, where for some reason they don't want people to get paid for their, their work that they want to consume um it's 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 tragic really there's a there's more than enough to go around and uh everyone gets a crown you know yeah i love it well thank you john and we love having you step off of my gown i love it <laughs> all, right. all right brother we'll have you back soon for more thank you so much thanks to everyone who tuned in today thanks to gerardo and kara Thanks to you for uh, for being my partner in this Damn. righteous endeavor. Right on. This bump. All right. Oh. Love you guys. Love you guys out there in the world. All right. All right. Thanks, John. You're awesome. Thanks, Kara. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining us today on Mormon Stories Podcast. Uh, we appreciate your patience as we work out the kinks, but we're grateful uh, to be able to do this job. So please uh, continue to support us when you can. Share the good word with everyone you can. If you have ideas about how to make our episodes better, comment on YouTube, comment on Facebook, comment on our blog, or send us an email at mormonstories at gmail.com. We'll forward emails on to John Larson or wherever they need to go. Um, and again, we just thank everyone for supporting what we do. And uh, be good to each other, be kind to each other. And uh, we'll see you all again soon on another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. Take care, everybody. <laughs>